Greetings everybody and welcome back to a brand new episode of some Bond Geek Talks About with me, your host, the name Stevens, Henry Stevens. Everybody, how do you do? Hope you're well, hope you're enjoying a good Bond film, a good Bond book, a good Bond video game, a good James Bond, whatever makes you part of this glorious fandom that is James Bond, everybody. Hello. And today we're going to be discussing Timothy Dawson's last film already, and also a bit of a milestone. This is the last film directed by John Glenn, the last one produced by Albert Arcubby Broccoli, the last with Robert Brown as M, with Caroline Bliss as Money Penny. You know, uh, a lot of the old guys are finishing here, and someone keeping on. But this is the Bond on Revenge movie, License to Kill. Um, originally called, if you're interested, did you know, uh, License Revoked. But before we get into that, everybody, can I just do my customary bit of house cleaning for the channel? Please um, like and comment on this video. Tell me what your thoughts are down below of License Kill. I'm always fascinated and interested to hear everybody. And also, if you want to as well, why not consider subscribing to the channel? Click the subscribe button and the notification bell icon down below to see future updates and videos. And as always, everybody, just a massive thank you from me to you for just coming on here and being part of the show. So, everybody, we're here to discuss License to Kill, um, the 16th James Bond film. Wow, we're already reaching number 16. So, let's get into this right about. Here is my initial thoughts about it. Um, I'm going to be honest. This one, for me, has never really been one of my absolute favourites. Um, I had a real source of... I didn't really like it that much as a child... Um, and as I've grown older, I've got a bit more respect for it, and there are certain bits that I've always loved, and we will definitely talk about things I love in License to Kill in this review, but overall, I feel this is, in the whole pantheon of Bond films, one of the biggest wasted opportunities, but I really need to go into this in more detail about this, because um, obviously part of the channel is always is me telling you about my experiences with James Bond, me growing up with them, my connections with James Bond, and License to Kill Everybody is certainly one of those films where I have a lot to talk about. Um, I think the best way I would start this off is this. If you've watched like previous reviews, I talked about, certainly in The Spy Who Loved Me, how I was terrified of Jaws. You know, you know, big guy, metal teeth. Um, I was terrified. I had nightmares about him sort of running and chasing me. My nightmares were nothing compared to the first time I ever watched License to Kill. Now, License to Kill was a film I think I saw about... First time I saw it, I think, was when I was about six years old. Now, imagine watching License to Kill at six years old. I was terrified of it. Uh, I was really scared. I, I found it just... I found it very... Ah, it's too scary, too scary, too scary. And I put off watching it for a while. Then I... Eventually, over the years, I kept re-watching and re-watching it a bit. But it was never, like, one of my utter favourites or one, like, I'd just run to go to. Nor would anybody else in my family, like, run to get to this video. Um, you know what? My family have had a sort of similar feeling with this film over the years when I've watched it. Um, obviously, for those of you who don't know... I used to watch the Bond films a lot with my grandfather. He loved the James Bond series with me. Um, so I have always the personal real strong connection with the series and him. He did not like License to Kill either. I mean, he didn't. It was too violent. It was too ugly. It was just too wrong. There wasn't there wasn't that James Bond essence in it. And that's going to come up quite a bit later. I don't think this film really feels like or is a James Bond movie. But we'll get into that. But, you know, my grandfather didn't like it. I, I do remember a lot, like, um, the scenes where, um, you know, Felix is fed to the shark, or Cress's head's blown up. I used to just hide in him when I was younger, because I just found it too scary to watch. Um, you know, so that, really enough, when I think about License to Kill, I just think about all the times I got so scared by it. But, everybody, look, let's just talk about the bad things first in this film, because there are a few, but there is some good things as well, everybody. There is, seriously. But the big thing for me what and big problem i have license to kill and i know other people have said this in the past so i'm sort of slightly copying what they said a bit but just do my own spin specifically uh joseph dallas and scott atkins from um you know uh the uh, bond a uh, um becoming being james bonds um they did that countdown uh, review to no time to die and they talked about um license to kill license to kill doesn't really feel like a bond film to me it didn't when i was younger and it doesn't really feel now it feels like more of a um it feels like more something you see out of Miami Vice or something I'd see out of Bad Boys, maybe. It, there's something about it. It doesn't really feel like a Bond film. Now, I'm being a bit um, hypocritical here because technically License to Kill does have all the elements I require in that, if you will, James Bond formula. But I think the tone and style of this film is completely off from what I think a Bond story should be. Look, even in the original Ian Fleming novels, 
Bond, you know, it was dark, it was dangerous, and there was stuff, you know, happened all the time. But at the same time, there was a sort of sophistication to it, I felt. License to Kill, to me, has no sophistication. I think, you know, when you hang ballroom, you know, sort of bar brawls in the film, you know, it's just not really James Bond for me. It's not. And I feel, you know, when you look at the story, there's such a wasted opportunity in the story. That's the next thing I really find. Apart from, like, the, I think the tone and the style is completely off this film. I think the story is a bit of a missed opportunity. And I say this because, really truthfully, you all know if you follow my channel, I love the character Felix Leiter. Felix Leiter is like, you know, Bond's best friend, you know, helps him on some missions and all that stuff. And I think I built him up a lot in my head. But, you know, throughout the series, he's really treated very pathetically and poorly, in my opinion. And obviously, um, in this film, he is one of the main crux of the film because, you know, obviously it's um, the villain who mutilates um, Felix that sends Bond on his revenge mission. But when you think about it, just after watching all the films and just seeing actually the friendship they have, even though in my head it's something a lot more, like I see them hanging out outside of work and stuff like that, and even being Felix's best man, which, by the way, why is his wife kissing Bond more than Felix and on the lips? I'm just going to point that out there. What the hell's going on here? But, you know, it's like... Would Bond really go out for revenge for Felix? Um, I'm going to be honest, yes. Uh, in my head, yes, because they're meant to be best friends and stuff. And like, if something happened to my best friend, I'd probably go out on a bit of a revenge spree if something like this happened to him. But really, just after all we've had and all we've seen him in, you know, there is that no connection there in the story. I just don't feel there's that connection there at all. And the other thing that annoys me is like, um, obviously, you know, Philly's getting married now. Obviously, a bit of history to repeat itself like with Bond and Tracy. But there's never that, like, scene. And I feel the scene is missing from the film. In my head, it sort of works where Bond should have had, at least had a chat with Felix saying, look, Felix, my friend, my brother, I've gone down this route in the past and look what happened to me. Are you really sure you did this? Because your enemies will use this against you. And just having that friend saying, I understand, mate. I understand how you feel that way. But, you know, everything's fine. I'm going to be retiring from, you know, on frontline stuff so I can have a life and stuff. And then having what happens then and seeing what happens and Bond, I can understand Bond really going out for revenge on that note. Um, you know, it's just, I just feel that scene is missing. There is stuff missing from this film. Um, the other thing I really, really don't like about uh, this film is I feel there's unintent, un just how can I, ninjas, yeah, I'll just have to say it, just call it out as this, ninjas, Bond fighting ninja, I mean, that's just, that's like back to the 70s with the, you know, taking on what was um good at the time, the idea of Bond fighting ninjas, even that little bit, Um, and you know what, I'm going to say this as well, this is something else that really annoys me in this film, it's some um, Sanchez's death, I'll get into Fran Sanchez later, but, you know, you have the bit at the end, you know, where, you know, he's finally about to kill Bond and, you know, Bond finally reveals a bit through the lighter that Felix gave him that he, you know, he's getting revenge on Felix. And I'm just thinking to myself, that is so unrewarding. You know, I wanted a whole scene where Felix, you know, Bond reveals to Sanchez properly, like, um, you you mut you attacked, you know, my best friend Felix. And then suddenly just remembering the CIA agent and he goes, <laughs> Uh, Mashag did not like him or something. Just there should have been a bigger scene about F Sanchez and Bond and sort of you know them to realizing that Bond's out to kill him because of Felix. And I don't get that in this movie. I don't. And I feel that's really, really pisses me off actually every time I see it because this is the thing. If you're going to do a revenge film, I think they didn't go full hearty with it. Um, because in this film, it's like you know they're trying to be a revenge but at the same time trying to remind you. Oh yes, it is a James Bond film as well. But this film doesn't feel like a James Bond film. It feels dirty and it feels feels ugly. You know, Bond can have that, but there's this element of, if you will, class and sophistication with the stories and the danger added into on that as well. That's a bit of the fantasy. This film completely forgets about all the elegance, in my opinion. It really does. But, you know, I, I could go on about the things I find annoying in this as well. But there are some good bits. And for all I moan about, you know, the darkness and stuff, some of these images and visuals are absolutely haunting and some amazing scenes. I, I go properly looking into the whole scene about when Felix does get fed to the shark here. I mean, that scene is chilling and also really sort of unnerving and just, it's so powerful and impressive. I mean, as a kid, I was terrified of it. And all it is, it's Felix being fed, put down into a tank and then, you know, you see a bit of what, you know, the shark does in the unrated cut. But it's just so impressive and the music as well and the dialogue and how there's some amazing scenes like this. And again, like um, but when Bond's finding on water and escapes via, you know, that war scene with a harpoon gun, that's brilliant. 
absolutely brilliant. Um, I do love the idea of Bond using, if you will, the Ujimbo storyline of going into the organization and destroying it from the inside out. There's a bit of that, if you will, the sort of same with Sherlock Holmes after killing Moriarty, going into the going abroad, destroying the organization. I really like that. That's actually quite good. Um, one of the other things I really love in this film is how Q sort of goes on for the ride. I know a lot of people probably disagree with that, but more Q the better, in my opinion, guys. Um, Q's wonderful in this film. I'll go into him again a bit more there. But a lot of people might be saying, well, Henry, what do you think about the tanker chase? Wasn't that stupid and idiotic? I love that tanker chase. That was amazing. That was a brilliant choreographed action sequence that also continued the story and told the story at the same time and gave you so much amazing visuals. I love the whole tanker chase sequence at the end. That is just terrific. I love it so much. It's um, I think it's brilliant with all the wheelies and the explosions and how things are paced and going along. And by the way, if you're a fan of James Bond, find the um, License to Kill DVD um, documentary of how it got made and it talks about that how haunted that place was. It's really incredible just wow it really is wow everybody i would strongly recommend doing that but listen that's um you know some of the things i really like about this film um let's just talk about the characters as well here now so let's go on let's start off this time with timothy dalton this is obviously his last performance um i have to say i think one of the films and things that makes this film bearable for me is knowing that it is timothy dalton playing james bond because i think he's again giving an incredible superb performance in this film he really that sort of his acting chops here about someone who's really been hurt and damaged and really just thinking purely out of anger, it shows in this film and he does it incredibly well. Timothy Dalton carries the film for me. I think it gets me through it every single time. Um, I just love Timothy Dalton as James Bond. I wish he could have done more Bond films. I wish he did. But, um, you know, this is his last film. I don't think his, um, his performance here is as good as what it was in Living Daylights. I think he's just gone a bit too far in this performance but it's still absolutely top notch absolutely brilliant but i think absolutely one of the highlights of this movie without shut down and he this character is in my top five villains of all times is robert darby's fran sanchez he is terrifying and brilliant and interesting and intellectual it's just everything that makes a great i think villain is in fran sanchez he's very much human you know he is an absolute human and i think we enough his obsession with loyalty not only makes him human, makes him, I think, weird enough. It's a relatable thing, and it just makes him more terrifying. I don't want to relate to you. You're awful, but I understand where you're coming from. Just he feels so real and so absolutely terrifying throughout this entire film. And I think every scene is on, especially when he is with Timothy Dalton playing off each other. It's just you, you know how some people say like you know there's a villain that sort of matches the Bond actor and they sort of perfectly play off each other. You know some people say it was like um, Sean Connery and Goldfinger, Roger Moore. It was him and Kamal Khan. For me, um, you know, the villain in this film complements Timothy Dalton's style perfectly. They both play off each other so well. And again, what a great thing to have in this film. I also think it's just how menacing he is. You know, when he works like this is nothing personal, just purely business. Uh, left with no valentine and stuff like that um you know just i love robert davia sanchez definitely one of the top villains of all time so no matter what i think about this film at least it gave me one of the top villains of all time i think in the bond series we've also got to talk i think about his henchman dario um dario obviously we meet at the beginning of the film cutting out um sanchez's girlfriend's um um lover's heart um off screen just hearing the screams oh my god that was just again terrifying you know, playing almost a sort of a Joker, Joker-esque sort of character with this nice Benicio Del Toro was incredible in this film. And, um, you know, I never would have believed he would have gone on to see such an amazing actor in my life, but I'm so wrong. After seeing The Last Jedi and Sicario and Che, oh God, watch Benicio Del Toro and Che, absolutely, 100%. But he is terrific in this movie, a real compliment as well to Fran Sanchez. You can see those two working off so well together. It's almost like, um, say, uh, Marco sort of, I fancy Sanchez a bit in a way. Um, you've obviously got Milton Cress, who's a bit of a middleman. He's um, interesting, a bit forgettable, but he's, um, I suppose he's all right as well. Nothing really special. But let's talk about the Bond girls here. Because obviously we've got um, Lupi, Sanchez's um, girlfriend, who wants um, to help, keeps trying to escape, but keeps failing, uses Bond to try and help escape. Um, again, um, interesting character. We've also got Pam Bouvier, the CIA agent, who we meet in the in a bond, in the bar brawl. Um, I've got to be honest, 
even though I love these characters, I think they carry on the great tradition of strong Bond women who are not just dumb bimbos, are really intellectual, sophisticated, interesting characters, whether they're being like hard ass called CIA agents or just, you, if you will, normal civilians. They keep up that tradition very well and really interesting and just not just idiots, which some people believe. But for the life of me, I just can't stand the character of Pam Bouvier. Um, I can't give you a, a proper reason for it. It's just, honestly, some characters, I think, in life just annoy you or rub you up the wrong way or you just find very annoying and just, like, I just don't want to watch you on the, the screen. And the character Pam Bouvier, for me, just is that character. It just doesn't work for me at all. Um, let's talk about, as well, um, so just a little bit extra on Lup uh, Lupe. She's very interesting. She uses her wits and cunning. I think she's a much better Bond girl. Um, and the one I sort of think is more interesting for the development of the story as well, but Pam Bouvier just doesn't work. Let's quickly talk about the finale of the uh, MI6 regulars here. Um, obviously, this is his last um, performance of Robert Brown as M. Again, actually, I said in Living Daylights, he works so much better against Timothy Dalton, and he does, again, in this film. The whole um, sort of comp confrontation between Bond and M when Bond does go rogue is absolutely terrific and just you can see in M's eyes like don't do this James don't do this James you can tell it in his face um it's just so wonderfully done and just even though he's um you know behind the scenes like saying he's going out of center he must be stopped he's actually trying to look out for James here I don't know what it, I always see in this film as M's trying to really look out for James here um and then obviously you've got Caroline Blissom's money penny just given enough just honestly a thankless little few things just to put her in um, but the highlight of the MI6 regulars is Q. Obviously, he now goes on the field a bit with Bond, helps him out, being a bit of a sort of uncle to him and helping him out. More Desmond Llewellyn, the better. I love Q in this film. Again, just helps out so much. And it's just so fun seeing these two together. Um, I don't think this is something Q probably would have done properly, but I love the f in, in the film anyway. And this is one of Desmond Llewellyn's best performances ever. So yeah, everybody, that's my thoughts on License to Kill. I think it's a massive wasted opportunity. It doesn't really feel like a James Bond film. They have to wrap everything up so neatly as well. Like, you know, with Felix recovering hospital after the death of his wife, still like, hey, James, let's go fishing. Um, it just adds to the annoyance of the film. It's such a wasted opportunity. I think a, bon a film about Bond going rogue and going on revenge is particularly interesting, but it just it's not done really well here, in my opinion. Um, the bad guys are amazing in this film, um, it, you know, but just overall for me, this is an abs this is a misfire in the series and something I'm not really a fan of that much. It would rank low on my list if, whenever I do my um, Bond ranking system. But I want to know, everybody, what are your thoughts on License to Kill? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you think it's great or not? Comment down below and tell me what you think. As always, everybody, my name's Henry Stevens and this has been some Bond Geek Talks About. Goodbye. <laughs>